disc brakes have swept onto our road bikes in recent years. We were a bit unsure at first, but now we realise that they are definitely a welcome addition. And as roadies, well, we can be accused of being Luddites from time to time, which is sometimes a fair point. Many of us roadies, we still don't quite understand how the disc brake actually works. I myself definitely don't understand. We just squeeze and, well, hope that they will work. Well, which they do. And when it comes to maintenance, well, we do shy away from time to time. I'm, I'm going to admit to that one. But what if I could tell you that we could help shed some light on the mysterious workings of the disc brake? Firstly, we'll tell you how disc brakes work. And then, with the help of Patrick Guze, the senior design engineer over at SRAM, well, he's going to tell you a lot more about disc brakes. More than I can tell you anyway. The transition of hydraulic disc brakes onto the road, well, it seemed like a matter of when, not if. With superior braking and also much better braking performance in the wet, it seemed inevitable really that the newfangled braking system would make the transition over to the road from our, well, how can I put this, dirty cousins over in mountain biking. But disc brakes start in road cycling, well, it wasn't without controversy. First introduced and allowed by the UCI in 2016, there were a few protests from riders when we began to see them in races. Quintana called them unnecessary and after an infamous crash with Fran Ventoso, then movie star rider, the UCI actually temporarily suspended the use of disc brakes in the peloton. But you know, while disc brakes developed, and we got used to them, we couldn't help but fall in love with them. Their braking, well, it was, it was brilliant. Superior braking performance. In the wet, it felt like you were braking in the dry. And the controversy seemed to kind of fall to the wayside as we realized their superiority. I myself was in two minds about them in the beginning, I'm not gonna lie. But I quickly found that as a bigger rider, the extra braking force was, well, it was a godsend if you ask me. It made braking in the bunch so much easier. You always knew what you were gonna get when you pulled on the brakes. It wasn't a question of braking and you know adjusting. It was every single time you pulled on those levers, you knew exactly how hard and how much you were gonna have to brake. So it just made handling for myself so much better. So to get a better understanding of how disc brakes work, well, we're gonna to need to get someone a bit more experienced than myself in the world of mechanics. So we were very lucky to get hold of the senior design engineer over at SRAM, Patrick Guze, and also their product manager, James Albert. So now we're joined by Patrick and James from SRAM to get a bit more in-depth and experienced knowledge of the disc braking system. Hey guys, thanks for joining us. Hi, Connor. Thanks for having us. Oh, thanks. Thanks for coming on. It's really great to have you. Um, and I guess just to start things off, how how long have you been working on a disc brake system? What's your experience, um, Patrick, with disc brakes? So I started my career in braking uh, in the year 2000 um, in automotive back in Detroit, Michigan. And how about yourself, James? I've been at SRAM going on eight years now. Uh, seven of those years I've been working on brakes with uh, engineers like Patrick. Um, but before that, I've been working on bicycles for quite some time. So I've been in the industry close to 15 years now. Oh, wow. And how would you say your experience with disc brakes on cars has helped you on bikes, Patrick? Well, originally my thoughts were that it would be much easier because it's just a smaller machine, right? But um, I quickly found out that with everything being shrunken down, all of the equations changed, changed drastically. So you go from having a lot of material to, to sink a lot of heat to being like this tiny, tiny little, little uh, components that, that, that then need a lot of thought and a lot of testing to make sure you're doing it correctly. 
I'd have thought the car hardest break would have been a lot harder to get to get used to. But um, I guess yeah, when everything's shrunken down, I didn't think of that. It'd be, well, it'd be and, tough. And with a with a vehicle, everything is fixed, so all your parameters are already outlined. Whereas with bicycle disc brakes, you need to ensure that everything is correct on a myriad of bike sizes, rotor sizes, frames, mountings. So there are a lot of different factors that play into it. When did that journey sort of begin for disc brakes onto road bikes, do you feel? So when I showed up at SRAM uh, almost eight years ago, uh, the team had been working on prototype road bikes. Uh, the, the guys had one of those Salsa La Cruz early kind of adventure bikes that they were playing with uh, mechanical disc brakes, but it was shortly uh, a, a switch over to figuring out how to get hydraulics in there because the advantages were so apparent. So. Uh, you, you play around with that, and then it's clear that you, you need to move in the direction of getting it uh, used on the in, intended audience there. So moving towards racing eventually in 2016 took quite a few years of work before that to get it up and running. But you applied the principles that you learned on the mountainside to a different uh, package to get it uh, to fit on the parameters of the road bike, and away you go. And what would you say were the main challenges for moving the disc brake system from the mountain bike to the road bike? One of the biggest ones is the hood, is making sure that you have room for all the mechanisms to control the drivetrain that sits right alongside all of the mechanisms to control a hydraulic disc brake. So packaging everything in a really small package like Patrick was talking about, uh, making sure it feels okay and that everything has enough room to perform in there too. So what were those first prototypes for the road bike like? I'm guessing they were a lot bigger than the ones we see today? We started out with... Uh, yeah. uh, remote reservoirs, meaning we bolted something underneath the stem to get all of the hydraulics separated from the controls. So there are big chunks of aluminum just hanging out underneath the stem that would power mountain disc calipers on one of those early frames that we had. Uh, and then you sort of iterate from there to get to where we are today. Let's go back to the beginning, back to simple terms. Maybe Patrick, you could answer this one. Um, how do disc brakes actually work? Well, it's actually relatively easy because basically there are three major components in a brake system, and that's a master cylinder, a hose, and a slave cylinder. Um, you actuate the master cylinder that builds pressure, the pressure transfers through the hose and creates braking force at the slave cylinders, which is at the caliper. Um, and what happens is, as the pressure builds in the master cylinder, the fluid moves through, actuates the, the slave cylinders, and they push the pads against the rotor. Okay, and if you want to create modulation, so say you want to have a really aggressive braking stance, so just a slight touch of the hoods will brake powerfully, or you want it to be kind of a more gradual braking force, how would you do that? So the modulation and the contact point, which I think is what you were talking about, um, is, is basically based upon both the system ratio, which is the difference in size between the master piston and the slave pistons, but also the leverage ratio. The leverage ratio is basically the ratio from where the pivot point of the lever is versus where the end of the end of the lever is and relative to the master cylinder. So the these equations play into it and then also the diameters of the master piston versus the slave pistons. And okay, so moving on to braking pads on the discs, how, how do they impact performance? Road and cyclocross, there are two pads that we recommend. The first for road riding is our organic pad compound. Like we were talking about, it, it's really quiet, gives good power, beds in easily. Uh, a metallic centered pad is good for wet conditions for cross riding, meaning so if you're going to be in the mud and you're going to be on a closed course and you want a little bit of extra wear protection, the metallic pads work really well there. So for most road riding though, the our organic pads are the best choice. What would you give it as, as advice for disc brake management? Is there anything particular that you could give us some insight from, from the industry or from your own experience on how best to manage disc brakes? Actually, I have the engineering advice, which is um, follow our instructions and leave them alone, usually. <laughs> but, but that's just the start. I think one of the biggest pro tips we can give is people say, oh, I might need to bleed my brakes. You don't really need to bleed your brakes. What lots of people feel is a soft lever, thinking, oh, there's fluid missing. It's just that you've done a whole bunch of really light lever pulls, 
and the pistons haven't advanced to keep up with the pad wear. So before bleeding your brakes, uh, check out how to do a pad advance, which we have documented in the manuals that uh, Patrick's talking about. It's way easier than doing the brake would do. Could you explain that very briefly, or is that quite sure. a complicated? Sure. So yeah. What you do is you take out your wheel, uh, you find your pad spacer, and you push your pad spacer between your brake pads with the wide end. Uh, then you take out that wide end, flip it around uh, to the, the, the notched end of the pad spacer, which is about the width of a rotor. You pull your brake lever and your pads will scoot up against uh, that spacer and it'll reset that relationship between the pad and the surface of the rotor and give you a more solid feeling level lever. I remember one of the, the main tips I was given when I was racing because I think um, I think we were I think I used disc brakes in the first year when we were using them in races. Maybe it was a year after. But um the mechanic told me never to let anyone touch the discs if if they were like outside the bus. We were supposed to go and chase people away from touching our discs. <laughs> and that, is that still the case? Yeah. That, that is the case. And any sort of contaminant that you might have on your fingers that you transfer to the surface of that rotor can get onto the brake pad and give you uh, diminished power and a little bit of noise. So keeping that, that surface between the brake pad and the rotor consistent is, is a good tip. If you know that you've gotten something on your rotor, the best thing you can do is wipe it down with isopropyl alcohol to remove anything on there uh, before you write it and get that contaminant on the surface of the brake pad. Um, so you okay. want to make sure you wipe down your your uh, rotor surface with alcohol if after you've done any sort of work with uh, sprays or anything around the back of the bike. So one of the things we see a lot is overspray of some sort of aerosol being used elsewhere on the bike. Where you, if you're doing it on your drive side and you get some aerosol particulate over onto the rotor surface that can contaminate your rotor so be careful while you're you're spraying things on the bike how many parts make up the disc braking system i'm guessing it's i'm guessing it's complicated have you got any and have you got any that you could show us there or so sure um so um this right here is a cutaway of of our etap lever um and as you can see here um there, there are quite a few parts that, that create this, uh, the master cylinder. Um, for the lever portion of, of, a, of a common road brake, we're at about roughly 30, 30 components that go into it. And then for a caliper, we're at around 10. Um, the, the, the main parts of a brake system are, you know, basically the master cylinder, the hose and the, and the slave cylinder, as we discussed before. But each one of those has anywhere from 10 to 15 parts. And in the case of a road lever, you're looking at about maybe 20 to 30 parts. On the, on the topic of rotors, what sort of size rotors would you recommend? Or is there a specific size for a certain purpose? Or Sure. Uh, rotor sizing is, is really based on the system weight. Um, so a, a larger rider should use larger rotors. Um, okay. but, and also the aggressive... The, the the level of the terrain that, that it's being ridden on. So, you know, in a closed course race, um, a, a larger rider um, would be fine on 140 millimeter rotors, but um, maybe we shouldn't be doing like descents in the Alps uh, if you're a 90 kilo rider on 140 millimeter rotors, maybe step up a size to 160s. So is that because the 140s would provide less power to stop? So there's less power on a 140 rotor. There's also less heat dissipation. So um, the larger the rotor, the more heat it can absorb and, and the better braking power you maintain um, throughout the, the range of heat. One thing I, I, mean, I always used to say to my teammates, one day we'll have wireless disc brakes, electronic wireless disc brakes. Is that, could that be a possibility or is that just too, is that too much? I mean, is it possible? Yes. Uh, well, it would, it would require a lot of work. I mean, for, for automotive brake by wire has many different components, which, which would inherently probably add quite a bit of weight um, because it's using essentially what would the, a pump to actuate the calipers. Um, and then you, there needs to be a feedback to give you that brake feel, um, which is a lot easier on the chassis of a vehicle versus what you would need to do to get that into the lever of a bicycle and then have a pump somewhere to be able to actuate the brake. So it's 
not out of the realm of possibility, but it would be quite a bit of work to, to implement that in, onto a bicycle frame. What, and one last question, but I think I kind of know the answer to it. Um, which brakes do you prefer, disc or rim brakes? I can't remember the last time I rode a bike with rim brakes on it. I don't know when I did either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah good point, good point the only bike in the garage is uh, with rim brakes is my kids 18 inch wheeled bike with rim brakes on it <laughs> yeah to learn how. But the bigger kids have 20 inches yeah. and she already is on disc brakes they just uh they put so much work into disc brakes and they perform so much better uh that there there's really no reason that i i ride rim brake bikes at all yeah definitely i think t- personally I definitely noticed the difference when I was racing. I think it's just you get such instant braking force when you're coming into any corner. You you don't have to kind of brake in advance or anything. You can literally just brake on the corner. It's incredible. Um, the consistency is the important thing with these systems is that you're going to get the same thing as you come into corners. So Patrick and I are in Colorado here and we do descending and you want to make sure that everything works right as you're coming up to that corner the way it worked in the corner before. And so disc brakes help you do that. Yeah, for sure. And I think that I think that allows you to get better handling as well. When you know you're getting the same braking force, I think it, it allows your handling to improve. Because before you're kind of in the dark about what you might get, you're always a bit nervous. So once you have the disc brakes, you can I think you can push on a little bit. Absolutely. And yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Thank you. So I hope this video has helped you learn more about the disc braking system. I certainly learned a whole heap, but I'd love to hear from you guys. What's your favorite part about disc brakes and their addition to road bikes? If you ask me, I think it's the fact that you can run wider tires on a road bike. And maybe I'm just making this up, but maybe it's what led to gravel bikes coming about. The fact that we could have really chunky tires on a road bike style geometry. And on that note, well, I think I'll take the gravel bike for a ride. What do you think? Thanks for watching, everyone. See you soon.